before I start, uh, just so that you understand, I'm a management consultant, not a not an agency person. But uh, for the last 25 years, I have been consulting to advertising agencies. And it, when I started in the UK with Ogilvy UK, uh, I was asked as a strategy consultant to start to solve a problem they had, which was they weren't making any money. Shortly after being acquired by WPP, and it's not an unusual thing to be called in as a consultant, uh, an industry you don't know. You, as a rule, know what type of data you need to get into the business and understand it. And so, at the time, I specified what I needed, and I'll talk to you about that a little bit later. Um, in order to understand the ad agency as a business operation, what is it that makes money sustainably over the long term? What type of relationships do you have to be in in order to make money over the long term? What type of value do you have to deliver in order to be retained in a long-term relationship and make good money? Those are the types of questions uh, that are analyzable if the right data exists. Anyway, uh, 25 years later, uh, having worked on these problems for ad agencies, I'm convinced of a couple things. Agencies have been screwed very badly <laughs> over the last 25 years, and some of it is their own. Uh, some of it is their own fault. So what I have done is uh, I wrote a book called Madison Avenue Manslaughter, which in a way uh, traced my journey through an understanding of agency economics and how they've changed, how they've changed over the last 25 years. It's led me to believe that today, more than ever, agencies need, the industry needs, but agencies in particular need a plan B. And I'll describe what plan A is, which isn't working, and what plan B is that will restore economic and strategic health to agencies. And this is just strictly based on the experience and the data that I have, uh, that I've picked up working with ad agencies over the years. Now, um, I think you know what, uh, what plan B is. Plan B is what you do when plan A self-destructs for whatever reason. We don't always have a plan B. When something comes up where we say, time for plan B, um, I get a lot of this uh, living in New York with bad weather. It happens all the time. You're planning a trip to Chicago or to somewhere else and the planes are late because you've been snowed in. Uh, important meeting with a client, you, it might involve some money and you have to, you have to develop a new plan. Uh, he was supposed to be plan B, but uh, you know, it's time for plan C. Sometimes plan B isn't good enough, and we need a plan C. Uh, sometimes plan B is a lot worse than plan A. <laughs> I think you know what I mean. Uh, Don Draper needs a plan B for the industry. Uh, if you all saw Mad Men, you understood that that was filmed about a time when agencies were on commission when television advertising was where all the money was being made, where creativity really drove brand sales. And the head of creative operations was the most important person in the agency. And today, as much as agencies would like to believe that that is the culture that exists today, the economics don't really favor it. The agencies are not being paid for it. If anything, their pay is going down every year, and something else is needed, but no one re can really put their finger on it, and no one really talks about it very much. So we're going to talk about that a bit today. Plan B is required because ad agencies are drowning in deliverables. That's one thing that's really happened. When I started analyzing Ogilvy UK back in 1990, uh, they did TV, they did radio, and they, and they did print. And it was the European headquarters for Ogilvy. Uh, they did a huge amount of origination work for very important clients like Ford and Unilever and DHL and others. And yet, in a year, they only did 360 briefs. That's all they did. 
A few years ago, I measured them again, and they were doing over 8,000 deliverables, and they weren't very much bigger in size. And that's because the business has shifted from TV, radio, and print to direct marketing, to digital, and to social advertising. And the volume of stuff that they have to get out every day is of a completely different uh, order of nature. And so agencies today are really massive production operations generating delivery after delivery after delivery in social and digital media, each one of them tiny. Each one tiny in terms of what it takes in terms of creative time and production time and client service and planning to get them out the door. Uh, nevertheless, having to be founded on good ideas, but there's really not a lot of time to do the good ideas. So this is a volume business, and that's an important change that's gone on. The management consultants are coming. That's another thing that if, if anyone had said 25 years ago that you'd have to worry about a Deloitte or an Accenture, a Price Waterhouse, or an IBM who bought, man, uh, who bought ad agencies, you'd laugh about it because you'd say, they're not, they're not creative. They don't understand creativity. And yet, uh, I started, half of my career has been spent at the Boston Consulting Group and Bain and & Company. And uh, so I know a little bit about how they operate and I know uh, that the consulting firms have grown at a rate that is astronomical. I started, when I started with Bain in the 70s, um, we were less than 100 people. And there are over 8,000 today around the world. And the pay for the people that work there is more than double what ag agency people are made. And the bonuses are a, a very high level. The billing rates are five times as high. So it, it cannot be argued that the consulting firms are not creative in their own way. Uh, that's something that, in their own way. It may be creative with spreadsheets, or it may be creative with convincing clients that they are the answer to performance problems. But whatever it is, they're being paid very, very well for their services. Holding companies are an interesting phenomenon of the last 30 years. And this guy, although uh, IPG has existed for much longer, uh, when Martin Sorrell started uh, WPP from scratch, he had the idea that you could buy, even on a hostile basis, big name agencies like JWT and Ogilvy, who had a wonderful commercial franchise but were not well managed. In fact, in 1986, when he bought J. Walter Thompson at the height of commission remuneration, uh, JWT was only making a 4% margin. Today, I, I will show you that agency remuneration has declined by two thirds since then, and JWT has to crank out a 15 to 20% margin for Martin Sorrell. So the holding company was based on the premise that you buy uh, great companies that are undermanaged and squeeze better performance out of them. That's all they've done for 30 years. They have squeezed through tight budgets, agency after agency, and of course, they acquire new agencies every year, but the whole deal about the holding company is to establish tough budgets so that management has to squeeze surplus resources out. Now, you might argue that after 30 years, there may not be a lot left to squeeze. And that's where we are today. And yet, the holding companies do not have a plan B. They are still squeezing the agencies who have had everything squeezed out of them and the media companies who are now under enormous pressure from their clients over tr issues of transparency. And yet, the holding company needs growth and profit improvement to hold up its share price. Um, I've always felt, you know, in writing this book, Madison Avenue Manslaughter, 
It's subtitled, An Inside View of Fee-Cutting Clients, Profit-Hungry Owners, and Declining Ad Agencies. And what I have observed over the 30, 25 years or so is that uh, clients are cutting fees and holding companies are squeezing the agencies for more performance, which leads the agencies to downsize, which reduces capabilities, which makes them less attractive partners, which leads to further fee cuts by clients. A doom loop. That is the case today. And yet, the holding companies are continuing, if anything, in a more desperate way to get more performance out of the creative agencies because the media agencies are now falling on their face. Yet, you can't lie to the marketplace, and I don't know if you can see this chart, but this is WPP share of performance this year. For the first time ever, the shares have gone down and they've dropped by 30% since February because the growth isn't there, the profitability isn't there, and there's no expectation of it coming back because clients, have, like big clients, Unilever and Ford and others have said, we're cutting back on spend because we're not getting the bang for the buck. So if you have media agencies who are up against uh, contract renegotiations, and you have creative agencies that have no place to go, and you've got clients that are cutting spend, you're gonna have a decline in holding company shares. And at some point, at some point in the next couple of years, the analysts uh, in the city and on Wall Street and elsewhere are gonna wonder if the parts are not worth more than the whole. That's always what happens when big conglomerates fail to deliver performance. Now this is a very scary thing for WPP, for IPG, for Omnicon, for Dentsu, for Publicis, uh, for MDC, and all the other holding companies, because the only way that they can really generate uh, a growth in margin is partly to acquire, and there's not an awful lot less left to buy, and then to squeeze for more performance. And yet we're, you know, in the 30 plus years down the road, there's not a left, lot left. This is gonna, I, I, I think in the next three years, we're gonna see a major upheaval somewhere. A holding company whose argument is not gonna to hold together uh, to Wall Street. I'm gonna argue that plan A, whatever that is, which is the basis for agency operations and the basis for making money has self-destructed. And you know, I don't think many people say that. Certainly agency people don't want to say it because it's a very upbeat industry, it's an optimistic industry, it's we can do anything, we can deliver any type of service, we can crack any type of a problem, we can always be creative. And that doesn't sit well with watching the fabric of an industry decline for a variety of reasons, many of which are not within their control. But uh, money and growth has dried up. That, I think, we can agree that clients are not paying the kind of money that they used to pay. And that headcounts are not growing. It's, it's, uh, you, it's very difficult to see any headcount growth in the industry. And when money and growth dry up, you have to say there's something fundamentally wrong with the infrastructure, with the business model. AOR relationships, have largely disappeared in the last several years if clients have gone out shopping for what they call best-in-class agencies to do uh, search, to do social, to do digital, to do TV, to do direct marketing, CRM, PR, and everything else they do. Now that violates a basic principle of good procurement practices because good procurement practices simplify the portfolio of suppliers and make them more intimate so that suppliers can work hand in love with their clients to solve big performance problems. The automotive industry and the aerospace industry and nearly every logistical industry has reduced the number of suppliers and made them intimate. This is the only industry I know where procurement has gone the other way and say, oh, the way to succeed is to have 
one of everything that's good. But the fallacy in that is that that means that no one agency has any kind of a voice within the portfolio. In fact, I think it would be better to have a above average agency that could do everything would deliver much better performance than a portfolio of 30 best in class agencies, none of whom have a voice. So there's a, there's a big flaw in a disappearance of the AOR relationship. Partly, agencies brought it on themselves by being late to integrating across media disciplines. But that said, procurement is going down the wrong path here. Respect for agencies, it's kind of a thing of the past. Uh, clients think that they are smarter, they are better, they're more experienced, they should be in the driver's seat. And part of it is driven by the fact that the AOR relationship disappeared. So who's going to run the portfolio of 2,000 agencies or 50 agencies or 20 agencies if not some person within the marketing department or marketing procurement who thinks that that's their job? And it's only a short step from that point to where the client starts taking full responsibility for the media plan and the media mix and the scope of work and its deliverables and what agency gets briefed on what thing, leaving agencies to just stand there waiting to be told what to do. That is not the sign of a healthy relationship when agencies are waiting to be told what to do because the clients are making all the decisions. That is not a partnership. Commodity pricing, worse every year. I'm going to show you a lot about pricing as I have analyzed it in the industry. Now, pricing is not price per hour. It's not overhead rate, and it's not profit margin. It's not a benchmark. Pricing is what they pay you for what you're doing. And actually, uh, uh, since agencies don't keep track of what they do, and they don't have a way of measuring it, there is no price for what you do. So I'm gonna to have to show you how I arrived at that in order to, in order to do my business. Uh, I had to know what the pricing was in the industry. So we'll take a look at it, but it is now skating at commodity levels. I mean, it's just barely covering cost with a little bit for a profit margin. And the costs that we're talking about are for depressed salaries and, uh, and almost non-existent bonuses, so uh, not terribly attractive. Reviews at the top of a hat. When I started in my business 25 years ago, uh, agency relationships were somewhere between 7 and 15 years. They're down to 2 to 3 years now. And uh, to read uh, in any of the trade magazines about who won what client, it's kind of silly because a client is not an annuity anymore. It's a, it's a, temporary, uh, it's a temporary stage. It's a couple years worth of work before the CMO decides, or a new CMO, because the previous one got fired, needs that a new agency is what, what the relationship needs. So reviews at the drop of a hat. It's serial dating is what it is. It's not a marriage. It's not a partnership. In-house agencies are a real threat. And in a way, the shift to digital and social has made this more possible because that so, much, so much of the volume is low value added. Resizing, email marketing, uh, posts on Facebook and Instagram, uh, the use of Google and paid search and all that other stuff. Clients think, I don't need to pay a high-priced agency to do that stuff, we can do it ourselves. But inevitably, as soon as they hire 10 to 20 people who want to work a 9-to-5 job and do resize things and email marketing, then they discover that they need a, a pretty decent head, ex-head of an agency to run that internal operation, and then that person gets ambitions like, well, why can't we do TV ads just like our AOR? or our person who used to be our AOR. And then there is an inevitable pressure for the in-house agency to start to do everything, and then to have to hire people away from you and, uh, and get involved before it all crumbles. But right now, we are in a period in which this is very much the vogue. Everybody's getting into it. They're doing media plans, they're doing scope of work planning, and they're doing more and more of the work, which takes the growth away 
which puts even greater pricing pressure. So this is not a good thing. I don't think it's very smart either, uh, because I don't think in-house agencies can bring anywhere near the depth of experience uh, that you can bring, but it's where, where things are going. Depressed salaries and invisible bonuses, we'll talk about that a little further, but there has been a big change in the level and quality of agency remuneration for its own people. So, there are client cutbacks in spend. We know that since about 2007 or so, that major commodity, uh, or I should say consumer brands have stopped growing. Now, that took place about the same time as the worldwide global financial crisis. But it also took place at about shortly after Facebook was established and the market started to shift to digital and social advertising. So you had big cutbacks in spend because of the crisis. And then when things came back, more of the spend was going into digital and social than in uh, TV, radio, and print. And it was also a time when the baby boomers gave way to the millennials in terms of which generation was the largest. It was also congruent with a time when e-commerce, uh, as in Amazon, which you, you now have here, uh, started taking over the distribution of a very wide range of products, uh, which hurt you know, brick and mortar retailing. So many things happened at the same time, uh, 2006, 7, 8, that we haven't really recovered from. And neither chief marketing officers, nor their agency partners, or for that matter, the consulting firms, have figured out how to get brands moving again. And I think that plan B for all the people participating in the industry will center on who figures out how to get the brands moving again. Uh, for the Procter & Gamble's, the Unilever's, the banks, the insurance companies, the credit card companies, and the rest. The marketing is very moribund right now, and chief marketing officers do not have a lot of credibility with their bosses. They don't have credibility because they are not delivering credible plans, they are not spending money wisely, and they don't really have good answers for why things aren't moving. And so I think this last year was the first year in which some of the big advertisers said, you know what, the hell with it, we're not going to spend anymore. That's what P&G did. They cut $140 million out of digital and social spend in one quarter and noted that it didn't make the slightest difference. They were still uh, not growing, but uh, they were spending less. So now we have Martin Sorrell telling the, the advertisers that they are doing something wrong by not investing in the business, but not recognizing that the agencies within the holding company portfolio are not actually contributing to the ideas that will help things to grow again. I think Plan B will be focused on who figures out how to get brands moving again in the world economy. Okay, what is Plan B? Before you decide what plan B is, decide what kind of plan A problems have to be solved. And I think a lot of people are getting this wrong because you hear people say, our real problem is there's no talent. Our real problem is we're not digital enough. Our real problem is there are too many pitches. Our real problem are the benchmarkers. And, and all of them add up to there's nothing we can do about it. We're just screwed, we're victims, and we just have to do the best we can. We have to win as much business as we can. We have to be as creative as we can under the circumstances. And even though we're on the losing side, we have to not be as big a losers as our competitors. I think that's wrong. I think that agencies today have misdiagnosed through the lack of the right kind of information about what really is happening to their business. And so I'm gonna be, uh, I'm pleading with you today to, uh, to think about a different type of plan B based on what has not been working in plan A, plan A being the way agencies have 
competed with one another and with their clients over the last 30 to 60 years. And I'm going to have to talk about words that really have never had a place in the industry. Price, productivity, and profitability. Okay? Price for agency services. The productivity of agency people in carrying out scopes of work. And the profitability that is associated with doing that well or doing that badly. Okay. Here's a real agency office. I've disguised it, calling it the Icarus Agency. Uh, it is a client of mine. And they have 10 clients, which I've, I've sort of used the military alphabet from uh, Alpha to Juliet. 10 clients adding up to $23 million in sales. That's sort of a size of a typical agency office. Not a headquarters office, but a good sized New York-based agency office. And you can see that uh, the largest client is a uh, hotel with 7.4 million. The smallest client is Foxtrot with 67,000 of income. And this is, when I ask finance to give me a view of each client in the way they kept their numbers, this is what they gave me. We've got the client name, we've got the fees that they're getting, We've got the full-time equivalents who are working on it, or at least are in the resource plan that was promised to the client, who add up to a certain number of hours, which was the basis for the agency being paid. And if you sort of divide the fee by the hours, you get the fees per hour. Now, how was it? there's a big variation in the fees per hour because the lowest one is uh, client Bravo at $54 per hour. And the highest is Juliet at 214. And you'd say, what could have possibly gone on that had a four to one difference in hourly rates? Well, it could be uh, there's, there are more senior people in it. It could be the competitive position of the client and they need more strategy work, and they, or maybe they need heavy TV work, or who knows what. Or maybe it's the salesmanship of the agency in trotting out for whatever the client has agreed to for the fee. And in a lot of these cases, as I found out later, the client told the agency what the, what the fee was going to be, because they said, well, we have a budget this year. I think it was a client Delta. We have a budget of 500000 that's all we can spend. So, I mean, there's a lot that we can do, but we only have a budget of 500,000. And the agency said, well, you know, we got some good senior people we can put on. They have two FTEs, and they're getting $139 per hour. Uh, this averages out to $138 per hour for the 23 million and the 94 FTEs. That's client service, planning, creative, and production people. Now, if you do the math, and I'm sure most of you know how to do that, $138 per hour for 1,760 hours uh, equals the fee, and then half of that, you know, roughly is overhead and so forth. If you do the math, that hourly billing rate supports people that are making between 104000 and 111000 That is not a lot of money. That is an average agency office whose average FTE on its clients is, uh, are earning 104 to 111000 I don't know how different it is here. Australian dollars, different salary levels, etc. But I can tell you that is not a lot of money. Now, it might be if you're hiring people as they do in the States right out of college at 30,000. When the consulting firms are hiring them at 75,000 right out of college, paying them a $20,000 signing bonus, we're up to 95, and giving them another 15,000 end of year guaranteed bonus, which takes them up to uh, you know, 110,000 their first year, knowing nothing. The difference in economics between the consulting firms 
and the agencies is all in the hourly billing rate. And the consultants are dealing with procurement too, but the procurement signing off on $500 an hour for an average team, as opposed to 138. But uh, even though we can get insights from this type of a tableau, uh, and by the way, not very often are these things all put up on you know, in one spreadsheet. Uh, finance directors will look at client uh, Foxtrot, you know, and you know, what's the fee and how many people and why do you need freelancers and you know, what are you gonna negotiate next year? But to put them all up like this, it, it actually takes, it almost has to take an outside to say, could I just see your data because I don't know anything about you. But here's what this tells me, and in fact, this is what I saw when I went to Ogilvy 25 years ago. How much work are you doing for that? For how much work are the 94 people doing, client by client? Well, they don't have, they didn't have records of that. I had to go into what they call job, job jackets, you know, you know, like we paid Joe Blow, the photographer, so much for the Ford shoot. Oh, that was for a print ad. Then, oh, I know I'm doing a print ad, et cetera. Took us seven weeks to reconstruct the 360 briefs that uh, Ogilvy UK was doing 25 years ago. Okay. Today, I'm working in Mexico. I've got 15 Mexican ad agencies. Uh, one of them has 12,000 briefs, and they're not huge. I mean, there's a lot of Facebook things. So you can imagine uh, how much work it is to reconstruct the scopes of work for an agency that's doing 12,000 briefs across its 20 clients, compared to one agency doing 360 25 years ago. But today, what hasn't changed in the industry is nobody is keeping track of what work is going on, client by client, how much work that measures, and how, what that implies for the number of people working on it. And as a consultant, I, I could not figure, I, you know, coming from the outside, I could not figure out what the hell is going on unless I know how much work are you doing, how much you're being paid for it, and how many people does it take client by client. And where that varies, why does it vary? Because that's the answer to figuring out who makes how much money? Okay, so I think of this as kind of a triangle. You know, you've got how much work you're doing on the top, how much you're being paid, this is client by client, and then what kind of resource and cost do you put against that? Because if you have all three of these dimensions, then if you take the, the fees and divide it by the workload, measured some way, you've got the price of the services. And if you have the resources, the headcounts, or the costs, and you've got the workload, you can say, how much is Darren Woolley doing, you know, in our creative department? How much does the average creative have to crank out for this client? Now, uh, then of course you've got income and cost, and agencies know what that number is, or at least they come close to it through timesheets and knowing we're making money, we're not making money. But they don't know that as well as they'd like, because of timesheets. But still, uh, at the end of the day, you know what an office profitability is. But I have not come across in 877 scopes of work that I've analyzed with my company in the last 25 years. I've not come a single one that had a scope of work that was usable for this purpose. So we have had to take whether uh, scopes of work in PowerPoint, in Excel, in Word, back of napkins, reconstructed through interviews, reconstructed through um, Excel sheets, job jackets. We've had to do reconstruction for the last 25 years and then there was the additional challenge of saying, well, a TV spot is not the same as a print ad, is not the same as a, as a website 
or a landing page or a Facebook post. They are, that's a very heterogeneous um, type of scope of work. And so what we need is to assign a value to each of the different types of deliverables that an agency does in accordance with perhaps how many creative man hours it ought to take. Well, uh, we found there were four dimensions, like the media type, TV, radio, print, direct marketing, blah, 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 social digital, etc. The detail, is it a TV 30, is it a TV 15 cut down, is it what? Is it an adaptation or an origination? And is it low average or high creative complexity? You know, a high creative complexity origination is usually for a product that's never been sold before. Or an, a new vehicle, an automotive relaunch of the Toyota Corolla. New campaign. Whereas an adaptation, low creative complexity, is so you cranked out a million, you're just doing another million and they have very low values. Anyway, we created a unit of work to cover the 7,000 different types of permutations and combinations of media type, media detail, origination, adaptation, three levels of creative complexity. So each one of them has a value so that we can say, if you did a thousand briefs, that's 300 scope metric units or it's 100 scope metric units, or it's 10, whatever. But you need a way of measuring uh, workload. And by the way, this is not a tricky problem uh, for this industry. It's doable. It's just that this industry has never done it. And it didn't do it, I think, because if we go back to the commission days, what was the point of keeping track of workload? You made so much money on commissions, you didn't need it. Besides, what matters is how much they spent on media, not how much work you were doing. So the industry, which developed a laissez-faire service attitude about workload many, many years ago when it was commission-based income, is now really up with its back against the wall because the workload has exploded in volume and nobody's keeping track of it. You got procurement cutting fees and you've got marketing experimenting with scopes of work, and you're caught in the middle, assuming you're all your agency folks here. So uh, figuring out price is important, but you have to understand how to do workload. Figuring out productivity is important because if there are huge differences client by client in price and in productivity, one of them's going to be right and one of them's going to be wrong. There are going to be low priced clients. They're going to be uh, clients that require an unacceptable amount of workload per creative. And that's what we're trying to figure out in order to uh, analyze agency operations. Okay. Now, uh, this shocking price curve is the results of price per scope metric unit among my clients over 25 years. I've taken inflation out, so this is in calculated in $2,015 US. But what it says, that first, uh, and these are hundreds of thousands of dollars per scope metric unit. But don't get hung up about what a scope metric unit is. Think of it as a TV ad equivalent, okay? If everything were done in TV ad equivalents in the scope of work, you wouldn't be far off. Ogilvy, UK, in $2,015 was earning from its commissions and the amount of work it did, $435,000 per unit of work. An ad agency today, if it's lucky, is earning $139,000. That has been a real two-thirds reduction in the price for what you're being paid. And this is consistent with every client that I've ever had, every, every agency I've had, every client within the agency portfolio. The reason the price curve is coming down is fees are being dropped and workloads are going up in an uncontrolled way. 
And if you divide one by the other, if you have a uh, increased denominator and a declining numerator, then you have a declining ratio. And so agency workloads have gone up, agency fees have come down, therefore the price of agency services have declined in a regular fashion. Among my clients and among, whenever I get a new client and look at it, there's somewhere around $139,000 level. It'll probably be 125,000 next year. Because why? Procurement's gonna cut even further. And the workload's gonna grow even further. And nobody is controlling it. No agencies control their price. It's being controlled by their clients. That's a very bad place to be when the clients are unhappy. Another thing happens when prices go down and you need to deliver a growing profit margin, which is what the holding companies require, you have to downsize. And when you downsize and the workload is going up, then the creatives have to crank out more work per head. And so these two, this is my experience with my clients. I've measured this from Ogilvy 1992, where they were doing 2.3 SMUs per creative, like two and a half ad, TD ads per creative, or five per team in a year. That's more than doubled today. And uh, uh, since I invented the, the SMU, <coughs> I figured out what was the right level. And the right level for this unit of work was the average creative should do a little over four a year because it was sized at about a TV ad. Well, you know, we blew right past that after 2005 uh, because agencies have been downsizing to make holding company margins. The workloads have gone up in an uncontrolled way. So creatives today are doing over five on average. But I'm gonna show you in a minute, if you look inside an agency office, there are clients where they're doing 10 to 20 SMUs per head because the fees are so terrible. So what have we concluded here? That you're in an industry with declining prices, declining headcounts, and growing workloads, and you're shoving more work through fewer people and stretching them. In addition, you've been shedding senior people because they're expensive and keeping junior people. So you have more work being done by fewer junior people and they're not solving client problems, which is why clients are turning agencies over more rapidly and going in-house. I mean, this is a doom loop. And uh, it's a doom loop as long as it continues without management getting in there and saying, we're gonna do something about this. We have to do something about it. All right, here's the same Icarus agency but I've put in, along with the fees, which you've already seen, the 23 million, I've put in the number of deliverables in the scopes of work. I've put in their scope metric unit value. And I've divided the fees by the SMUs to show the price. Now, if you assume that an SMU is a good, um, homogenizer that, I don't know, uh, 30 Facebook posts are equal in effort to one TV ad or something like that. If you assume that's okay, then an SMU is an SMU. And if you're being paid $34,000 per SMU by Client Alpha and $407,000 by Client Juliet, one is paying a whole lot of money and the other one's paying next to nothing but the average is 139,000, which is just about where the industry averages today. So you go into an agency, you review the portfolio of clients, and you say, you know, this product that you're selling, which is the SMU, <laughs> you're getting 34,000 from these guys and you're getting 400,000, how come? And the, the how come is that nobody has the slightest idea of how much work they're doing. The agency management doesn't have the slightest idea. The CEO of the office has no idea what's going on in each of the 10 clients. The CFO 
has no idea what work is going on. None of the client heads know what's going on in each other's business. Whatever they are dealing with, they're dealing with as best they can. And they're under a lot of pressure, particularly client alpha here, which, has, which is a million and a half, or even it's a reasonable size client, uh, is doing a ton, a ton of digital and social work, 444 briefs, and getting very little money for it, having few, uh, 2.3 creative FTEs to do 40 SMUs, so they're doing nearly 20 SMUs per head when the standard is four to five. So they're cranking out five times as much as they can. They're going crazy, people are quitting. But nobody can say, well, the reason that's happening is because we're doing five times as much output on this client as we are on the average client in the office. And then, in the high price client, Juliet at 400,000, doing, fifth, what is it, 15 deliverables for uh, 8.7 SMUs, a lot of TV work. Uh, they're only doing two SMUs per head. They're pretty comfortable. Now, I'll tell you, I said to when we went through this, I said, you know, thank God you've got these clients that are above 139,000. You know, you've got Golf Hotel India Juliet that are above that and the others are below because they're shoring up for the office sake, the profitability. But if you should, if your client ever gets wind of the fact that they're paying well over the odds for your resources, you're in trouble. And guess what? I mean, honest to God, I didn't know anything about it, but they lost their top two clients. They had to, uh, you know, about three months later, they had to downsize by a third, and they really have not recovered because they had to go through a major downsizing without the cash cows. So, you know, you're kind of screwed if you're being underpaid. You're in danger and vulnerable if you're being overpaid in today's market. You cannot take comfort in having a portfolio of clients in which half of them are holding up the other half and that you're okay for the holding company on average. By the way, on average isn't very good because uh, as we know, uh, the average billing rate here is $138 an hour, which is only supporting $100,000 to $110,000 people. So you don't have a huge talent pool on that basis. Uh, this is a scary situation, and this is typical of what I find today in every agency I diagnose. And it's a one-off diagnosis. It's, I mean, nobody, nobody ever sees this because nobody has any workload metrics. So CFOs can only look at the profitability. It is quite possible that every one of these clients is earning a 15% margin. And that's why uh, client alpha only has two people for a ton of work. Because they're making a margin. They've allocated the resources in proportion to the fee and not in proportion to the work. That's the way agencies work to do. That's what finance directors will do. They say, what is this, a $2 million client? Well, you can afford X number of people. That's how many we'll give you. And nobody knows how much work is involved. Actually, if you graph any office, it looks like this. The balls there are the clients. The price along the horizontal axis is the price per SMU, from high on the right to low on the left. And then up and down, it is the FTEs, or the, the number of people per SMU. And the red clients are underpaid and under-resourced. And these other ones that are supposed to be green <laughs> are overpaid and over-resourced. And the average is where those lines cross. Here's the problem. That vertical line, which is set at $139,000 per SMU, is moving to the left every year because the industry price is coming down. So what's happening is all of these balls are getting shoved to the left. And that means that the resources are being, everything's being shoved to the lower left-hand corner. So that means that over time, even as stable portfolio of clients with no new ones, no old ones, 
is going to show a deterioration in the amount of people that can be placed against the workload. Because we can expect the workloads go up every year and the fees come down. So even in a stable situation, if workload is not being controlled or measured or negotiated for fees, the average agency portfolio will get worse in quality. In other words, the productivity will go up, meaning more work per creative, and the price per SME will go down. It's a combination of this, which is a static view, and that price curve which I showed you, which is shoving everything to the left. The other one, which is a little, little more meaningful, goes down the other way. This is creative output per creative on the left-hand axis against the same clients arrayed by price per SMU. So, upper left-hand corner, uh, agencies cranking out a huge amount of work per head on the creatives for, low, for being low-priced. Understandable. Low-priced, few resources, a lot of work. Whereas down here, uh, the big fat clients that are paid well have enough creative resources to do the work comfortably and somewhere there is an average. But it still means that a big proportion of the portfolio is under-investing and those clients are at risk. That, those clients on the left-hand side are at risk for quality. The clients on the right-hand side are at risk for overcharging. The whole portfolio is at risk and this is the standard situation today of ad agencies. It isn't the standard way people think about what the agency problem is, but as soon as you measure workloads, this is what emerges. Okay, what about profitability? Uh, in a way, during the commission era, agencies could afford senior people, very high priced, Lots of resources. Ogilvy had three, four, and five teams on every client back in 1992. That's why they weren't making any money. That's what we discovered. There are no more multiple teams today. It's just gone. And the teams are more junior and underpaid. There's been a real serious deterioration in real dollars, take inflation out, in what average pay levels are and average billing rates. So there's been a decline in the composition of the headcounts. Uh, and I'm going to show you, this is a little unfair to Saatchi, but what the hell. Um, uh, Kevin Roberts, the CEO of Saatchi, wrote the foreword to my book and argued with me. And he was a client, he argued with me about a lot of things, so I don't mind picking on him who is now gone and who made some unflattering remarks about women. Uh, which cost him his job at Publicis. Let's look at Saatchi. A person one year out of college in an agency at Saatchi, U.S., according to Glassdoor.com, makes 52.9 thousand. That strikes me as a high number, having looked at their salaries, but I'll accept at Glassdoor.com that an account executive, a relatively junior account person, makes 52,000 U.S. dollars. Billing multiples, that's what do we charge the client as a multiple of salary? You know how, I mean, you know how procurement does it. It's direct cost plus overhead rate plus profit margin equals blah, blah, blah. They don't quite do that at the consulting firms. They, the consulting firms just tell them what the hourly rate is. Take it or leave it. Um, but when you look at that, billing multiples for a 15% margin, and a one times overhead rate agencies are marking up their people 2.3 times. So a $100,000 person is being billed out at 230,000. Typical, 15% margin, one times overhead rate. Five times salaries at Bain, McKinsey, BCG, Deloitte, Accenture. That's just, it has been standard for 30 years. That's where it is today and procurement accepts it. So if you work that out, given the differences in the salaries, the Saatchi and Saatchi one-year person is being billed out at 66 an hour, and the Bain guy is being, or gal, is being billed out at 214. Why? 
I mean, the, the quality of the person could be comparable. And I think it comes down to this. So I've pulled this off of the Bain website, but having spent a big part of my career there, I know it to be true. Right off of the website, in the part called performance, pro, uh, performance improvement, they say, our client, we're the best uh, consulting firm for companies that are committed to quickly achieving and sustaining their full potential. Meaning, you're operating here, you want to be there. You want to grow, you want to be more profitable. Our clients realize, on average, results yielding 25 times returns on our fees and margin improvements of seven percentage points within two or three years. A large amount of effort in a consulting relationship goes into negotiating the relationship and what's going to be done. Why are we going to work together? And the consulting firm will usually require uh, that they uh, develop a view of what the full potential of the client is and that that forms the basis of the consulting relationship. So if you're a, a big advertiser and you're growing at 3% per year and you figure you should be growing at double the rate, then the consulting firm would say, we will put together a relationship based on our doubling the rate of growth over the next five years. And that will form the basis of our scope of work, of our budget, and of the need for a commitment for a long-term relationship, okay? And we expect to deliver an X time return. If the return is big enough, who cares whether it's a five times multiple on fees? I've pulled this off of Saatchi. It's one of the worst websites in the industry. And I didn't pick it because of that. I honestly picked it because I worked with Kevin. Okay. It is all over the map what the purpose is. Our purpose, we have a dream to be revered as the hothouse for world-changing creative ideas that transform our clients' businesses, brands, and reputation. It isn't what they actually do, though. Spirit, one team, one dream, nothing is impossible. Beliefs, love mark beyond brand, blah, blah, blah. But you get down to the greatest imaginable challenge, and it says to transform our top 20 offices from good to great. I'll tell you, I wouldn't pay five times multiple to help them go from mediocre to okay. <laughs> or to fill the world with love marks, which is the other focus. I mean, they work, they're huge. The Procter & Gamble's their largest client. General Mills was their second largest client. They just got fired from that. Toyota, worldwide, uh, is sort of next in line. They do a fabulous job with Toyota in the States. They got fired in Europe because they are not focused on achieving client needs. They don't ask about it. They don't have the capability of figuring out what needs to be done to make it better. And except in certain pockets, I think their LA office is fabulous, but it's a different group of people. And what they do there has nothing to do with what they do anywhere else. But this comes from the CEO. This is the CEO's vision, and it's a highly romantic and qualitative vision for the kind of dialogue that he or she can have with the creative staff or maybe even in new business situations. But it doesn't say anything about what is going to deliver a return for the clients. Because while this might have worked a long time ago when TV advertising was new, and really creative TV advertising really drove, drove brand growth, it is not true today. And whatever this is a vision for, it is not a vision for what the problems of clients are today. And a lot of agency websites are sort of variations on this. Inward looking, narcissistic, about creativity, um, uh, but not really saying, you know, we're really good at figuring out how to make you better, which is what clients need. And that's what CMOs and their CEOs need today to invest money in more media spend 
in agency fees and hire multiples for your services. So I think in the end, plan A, if that is, if that is plan A, which is strong belief in 1960s creativity, don't track workload. Don't negotiate workload. Do whatever the client wants to have done at whatever fee they're prepared to pay. I think that everything else that we're seeing in the industry is a symptom of that plan A. Those, that set of beliefs. I think the loss of AOR status, the in-house agencies, the pitching process, the loss of respect, uh, the decline in fees, the experimentation with workloads. I think all of that are symptoms of a business concept that worked a very long time ago with a different, when the world was at a different place in terms of media types and, uh, and underlying GDP growth. We're in a different place today. And that business model is held intact by many agency leaders. You see it all the time. New CEO comes into an agency and they say, we're gonna get back to basics, we're gonna invest in creativity, we're gonna win awards, we're gonna do this, that, and the other. And the truth of the matter is, nobody's paying for that. And procurement's gonna to continue to cut the fees, and the marketing's gonna to continue to grow the workloads, and the prices are gonna to continue to come down, and agencies are gonna to continue to downsize, and pretty soon the holding company share price is gonna run out of steam and then the analyst is gonna say, what the hell has been going on here? So, let's decide what's wrong with plan A. Agencies have not exercised control over pricing. Pricing is in decline because workloads have been ignored. With declining prices, agencies have downsized. With downsizing, agencies have eroded their capabilities. With eroded capabilities, agencies have failed to solve complex client brand growth problems. With eroded capabilities, they fail to solve the problems and therefore, pricing is the number one problem in the industry. Getting control of pricing means getting control of workloads. Getting control of workloads means negotiating fees on a different basis. Negotiating fees on a different basis can only succeed if the agency mission is a different one. So it may sound like a simple thing to say, hey, you guys have got to get control of pricing, but you know what it means? It means changing the whole way you think about the business. Why you exist, what you have to keep track of, <coughs> Who's accountable for what? And how you negotiate being paid. And that's a complete change of culture and there aren't many CEOs that want to take that on at this point in their career when many of them are making seven figure salaries for doing plan A, delivering to the holding company. So this is a really tough turnaround situation because the leadership isn't young enough to care they're not going to have to live with the consequences. So, mission. And I, I'm, I'm not going to start with pricing, I'm going to start with mission. And I'm ripping a page out of the consulting playbook here. I think the agency's strategic mission should be on behalf of its clients. And it should read something like, our mission is to identify and quanti quantify and realize the brand's full performance potential. It starts with the premise that any client that has a portfolio of brands is underperforming. P&G is underperforming, Nestle is underperforming, Unilever is underperforming, American Express, Ford Motor Company, General Motors, any of the banks, Australian banks, New Zealand banks, US banks, Brazilian banks. Everybody is underperforming their full potential because they have not focused on figuring out why they're underperforming and what they need to do about it. So, in order to be in a position 
to identify and quantify and realize you have to negotiate a top level strategic partnership that said that's why we're going to be in business together we're not in business together to develop a digital campaign for brand x we are in business to get your brands growing again we know how to do it we know how to figure out where the growth potential is and we know how to execute but we have to work together it takes time and then there's a skills requirement because you have to bring on board in your account department the kind of people that can do that business analysis. A young person coming out of university and going to one of the big consulting firms will be trained over seven weeks in how to do this type of analysis. How to do a full performance potential analysis. What data do you need? What kind of slides do you use? It's fairly, it's been routinized. But I don't know of many account heads that ever mobilize their team to do that on behalf of their clients. They're kind of there hoping they can get the work out the door without losing the client. And it's a lot, of, a lot of what client service does is to maintain the relationship. So what's really needed are consulting like business analytical skills at the front end. And then the ability to put together the type of program that will actually work. That's a scope of work expertise, where the agency takes responsibility for the scope of work because it has to be the one they want to do. Okay, that takes us to scope of work management, and you know, given how painful the consulting experience has been for me over 25 years, it's still having to reconstruct scope of work. I like to see people, agencies, that take this on seriously. So. The agency must design and negotiate the scope of work. Now, clients are going to do it too. But I think agencies have to be first out of the gate and say, look, we think in 2018, the scope that is likely to get our brands back on track is this one. This media mix, this number of deliverables, this number of originations, this number of adaptations, and if that is too pricey for the budget, we'll re-engineer it. We'll do fewer originations and more adaptation. We'll do something. We will do something so that the scope of work is affordable by you. It'll be the best scope of work you can get for your money. We will take responsibility for it. And then you negotiate it. But I don't know anybody that does this for the most part. Agencies must go negotiate fees based on the scope of work workloads. Now, if you have a system of deliverables and scope metric units, it's not hard to do. Uh, one of my Mexican clients works with Mondelez and they have been successful in getting Mondelez to pay by deliverable. How? It's a scope metric. The Mondelez knows the scope metric value of every type of brief in the scope of work and they use a price per SMU to pay them. Now in Mexico, uh, the right price per SMU is about 500,000 pesos per SMU. And they're getting about 500,000 pesos for each of the different types. So all they have to negotiate, after having negotiated that, uh, all they have to negotiate then is how many deliverables are they going to do and how many SMUs, and therefore what does that add up to? If it's too much money, we'll cut back. Um, so it's totally doable and the agency's in charge of getting out in front. Uh, then there's the internal policy, which says, in the agency, every one of our clients, we will require each account head to document, track, and measure scopes of work in a uniform format using our own system. I don't know of anyone who does that, because there are some people that use Decideware, because the client Nestle uses Decideware. So the agencies that serve Nestle use Decideware in some form. And uh, others have their own system, but I don't know of any uniform agency method for saying, we are going to keep the scope of work this way, because we need to know in a uniform way what Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, and Delta are doing, and who's being overpaid and who's being underpaid, and who's being stretched and who isn't being stretched. So every client in every agency office must have its SOWs documented and measured 
in a uniform way. Uh, CEO, agency CEO's eyes glaze over when I say, you know, this is your policy, this is what you have to do. Um, aren't we doing that already? Uh, no. Uh, well, that's up to each office, isn't it? I mean, you know, a London office does it this way. They've got a system for doing it. I said, no, they don't. Anybody that tells you that they have a system and they know how much work is going on is not telling you the truth. And I understand why they are. But nobody in your whole global organization has the slightest idea, other than the client head, roughly, what work is going on. Nobody is in a position to review it, look at it, measure it, comment on it, criticize it. Are we working on the right stuff for Nestle? Is it going to move the brands? Could anybody ask that question? If nobody knows the scope of work other than the, the person running Nestle, it's impossible. So in a way, agencies have delegated to the account heads the running of the agency without anybody looking over their shoulder to see what kind of decisions they're making. That's not good when you have aggressive clients cutting fees. So. The agency must design and negotiate recommended scopes of work. Agencies must negotiate fees. Agencies must use a uniform format. And then I've got a system called Scope Metrics, which Darren uses for his clients. It's available. It's a scope metric system. It's off the shelf. It is simple. It's an, like an online Excel system that allows you to put in the deliverables so and figures out this, you know, the SMU thing. Our scope of work measurement system, which is the only one in the industry, I'm sad to say, uh, is the only one for quantifying workloads for fee setting purposes. It works. And people that have used it have had success. But it's a really hard sell because agency leaders don't want to manage agencies. They want to develop new clients. And like the account is, deal with the crap. All right, accountability. This is another big business management issue. Account heads need to be accountable for the decisions they make and the situations they've inherited. Now, just think through client Alpha through Juliet. And I think Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, Delta, and Echo were all underpaid and overworked. And there are client heads that are running that every year. And every year they're agreeing to a scope of work, every year they're agreeing to a free, and every year they're being given a limited number of resources to do it, and the work's killing them. Which of those client heads is under management's eye to say, you have got to fix that situation. We cannot accept $34,000 per SMU when we needed a minimum of 139 or 150. Well, what are you going to do about it this year? Can you cut? Can you keep the fee and cut back the scope? Can you cut out the 20% that's crap that isn't doing anything for the brands? Could you change the media mix? Could you get more money? Could we work on a different mission? That dialogue isn't going on. So account heads have to be held accountable, but they're not going to do it themselves. Being held accountable means being held accountable by somebody. Office head, office heads don't feel like they are responsible for client heads. Office heads are responsible for hiring and making their numbers with a finance director. So agency top management must measure, review, and manage account head performance just like at General Electric Corporation or any other big company where somebody who's given a business to run is held accountable for achieving certain objectives. It doesn't exist in the agency world because there's a kind of creative cop-out. Like, we're a creative operation. We, we don't work that way. One of the things that Kevin Roberts and I used to argue about is he told me his concept of leadership. He said, farmer, you got to realize, an ad agency is just like an ant hill. Every ant knows its job and needs the freedom to do it. There's no king of the ant hill. The queen of the ant hill lays eggs. I'm sort of like the queen of the ant hill. I go out and develop climates, but our, our ants need to know what they're doing. And the truth of the matter is that in the 
years that he and I worked together, Saatchi downsized by 30% because he could not come to grips with the need to manage workload. He let me do my thing there, but he didn't hold people accountable for the situation. Okay. And then there needs to be a system because there needs to be a uniform system for measuring the work, measuring the price, measuring the productivity, measuring the profitability that allows a comparison across clients, just like you saw at the Icarus agency. Finally, account heads have to develop action plans to fix their bad situations. They may have inherited them. It may not be their fault that the fees are terrible. But it doesn't matter, they're stuck with it, they have to fix it. So, in summary, I think plan B, if you accept what's wrong with plan A, then plan B has to be uh, the following. That you have to reposition the agency to analyze and fix client brand problems. You have to create a culture of measurement and accountability rather than an anthill free-for-all. You need to implement something like a scope metric system to document, measure, and utilize the information. You need to track, measure, negotiate remuneration based on workload, not on what the client's prepared to spend. You need to hold account heads accountable. You need to review and measure their performance. You need to fix underperforming clients. That's how you get control of price. Again, it all comes back to price. The repositioning, clients will pay for improved results, and they'll pay agencies if agencies can do it. So repositioning the agency on results is a way of fixing price. Measuring workloads and negotiating workloads is a way of fixing price. Holding account heads accountable is expanding the number of people who worry about these things and can do something about it. So it's expanding the management team. It's a way of getting control of price. Ultimately, I would think that the agency, that the game of advertising is about developing premium pricing from clients that moves up towards the consulting level of a five times multiple because the work is effective. So the game of advertising, if you had, uh, if you wanted to array agencies or across the spectrum, who's really successful and who is not, and you had the data on price per SMU of their offices by client, and you could compare them, I will bet you that the agency that has the most premium pricing sustainably over a long period is the winning agency. And so it says, what we need to win in this industry are long-term relationships, the longest duration of clients, and the highest price per SMU that is sustainable. That's success. And those dimensions only exist on this slide. <laughs> they, don't, they don't exist in the head of anybody. So if you are in a position to Think about a plan B. Think what we're trying to achieve in the long term is the sustainability of our client relationships and the price premium from doing really great work that generates results. And if you do that, you will have successfully created a plan B that is not a Madison Avenue manslaughter, but is instead a Madison Avenue makeover. Thank you very much.